Hello, friends. Good to see you. Uh, welcome to our third and final Great Books mini lecture for this semester. Uh, I'm Michael Carriger, and along with Maureen Fitzpatrick, we've been curating uh, the presentations. And we ask that you join us again next semester. We have three more, and they're going to be absolutely fabulous. Uh, I'm very excited about today. Uh, Andrea is a wonderful presenter, but, but we also have a great, great book uh, in front of us. Uh, to begin, Andrea View is Assistant Professor of History and Political Science here at JCCC. She earned her Bachelor's of General Studies with a major in Political Science and a minor in Mathematics from the University of Kansas. She also has a Master of Arts in Political Science from KU with a focus in American politics and policy, comparative politics, and research methods. And she earned a PhD in Political Science from KU with a similar focus. Not done. She also holds <laughs> A graduate certificate in nonprofit management from the University of Central Florida, and she's currently pursuing a master's in nonprofit management and a graduate certificate in fundraising from UCF. You're busy. Yes. Uh, and by the way, <laughs> that whole journey started here at JCCC, where she earned her associates in liberal arts. Yeah. Students! <laughs> Three years ago, Andrea joined us on faculty full time, uh, but years before that, she, uh, during her graduate studies, uh, she provided adjunct work to the college. And just prior to joining us full time, she taught in the political science department at the University of Central Florida in Orlando. Uh, here, she is involved in many aspects of campus life. Uh, she is co-advisor for the Political Engagement and Leadership Alliance, which is a nonpartisan club that aims to promote civic engagement and civil discourse. Um, you're gonna have a busy next year, I would imagine. Uh, and you will find her in uh, the food court where she collaborates with the Center for Student Involvement hosting monthly trivia games. Professor View has many interests, but most of her research centers on young people in the political system. Uh, and this primarily includes uh, both K through 12 educational policy and political behavior and opinions of younger generations. She's also currently exploring the scholarship of teaching and learning, examining the impact of community learning projects in political science courses. She is also an animal lover. She owns two cats. And that fact is actually rather important today for our presentation. Professor View has chosen Jessamine Ward's Salvage the Bones, which has underpinning it an animal story, um, a sad, it is very sad. It is sad. Animal story. Uh, she was first drawn to the novel because Jesmyn Ward was recently a speaker for the Dole Humanities Lecture Series at KU. And the novel itself centers on Hurricane Katrina, which is a tragedy that most of us, students included, can easily recall. Uh, a tragedy that revealed many of our social, economic, and political failures. At the end of Professor View's remarks, we'll have time for questions, so think of some good ones. Andrew, have you? All right, thank you. I'm going to pull this closer. As close as it can get. So yes, m um, I'm doing the book Salvage the Bones, and this was supposed to be a picture of post-Katrina flooding. It didn't really show up well, so I feel bad about that. But here we go. Um, Jesmyn Ward is the author of Salvage the Bones, so I just wanted to kind of give you a little backstory about her, because it is pretty central to the book and there's some relationships between her life and the book. So um, first of all, she is actually an associate professor of creative writing at Tulane. Um, she has a master's in media and communications and also a master's of fine arts. Um, I think the first one's from Stanford, the second one's from University of Michigan, if I'm remembering that correctly. She is the um, recipient of a MacArthur Genius Grant, if that kind of gives you any indication about how you know, well received her works have been. Um, historically. She is also the first woman to win two National Book Awards for fiction. The first one is the one that I'm doing today, Salvage the Bones, and then the second one is called Sing Unburied Sing. Um, she, just a little, a little quip here, she has also received the Steiner Fellowship at Stanford, the John and Renee Grisham Writers Residency at the University of Mississippi, and the Strauss Living Prize. So um, very well renowned in terms of you know, public acknowledgement of her work. She has a long history of authoring, so um, Salvage the Bone, Bones was her second book. Um, Men We Reaped 
is actually a book that's a memoir about her brother and then also the experience of black males growing up in the community where she grew up. Um, Sing Unburied Sing follows three generations living in rural Mississippi and sort of their experience. It's situated in the same place that this book today is also situated in. Navigate Your Stars is what is coming out this January. And it is actually, a, um, she gave a commencement speech at Tulane in 2018, kind of about hard work, um, the importance of respecting yourself and others, and some of the challenges that she overcame. And that has been turned into a book. So that's going to be coming out next year. And then these last two, I just, she edited a collection of essays about contemporary racism. Um, and that is The Fire This Time A New Generation Speaks About Race. And then coming out in 2020, I think it's January 2020, she has contributed an essay to The Fight of the Century, which is about 100 years of the ACLU and like landmark cases of the ACLU. And her contribution focuses on how loitering charges are used to police the black community. OK. So Jasmine Ward actually grew up in Delisle, Mississippi. And I'm going to try to show you a little bit on this map what we're talking about. This is Hurricane Katrina. Um, we often think about Hurricane Katrina and its effect on Louisiana and then omit the stories of people in Mississippi. The problem with that is that, um, so I'm trying to keep the mic close, but um, the major winds actually hit Gulfport, Mississippi. And then Delisle is just a little bit north and west of that. So that's kind of where she grew up. Um, she actually lived through Hurricane Katrina. So there's a really interesting familial story where she and her family tried to ride out the hurricane, as, as many people did at that time. There was so much flooding, they had to flee their home in the middle of the hurricane. They sought refuge um, in a field. They drove their car into a field with a bunch of tractors that were basically parked on a hill. One of their neighbors, um, some of their white neighbors, came to check on their tractors and refused to give them um, safety in their home. They later were able to find refuge with another group of white neighbors that did take them in. So she has, it, this comes back up later, that's why I'm bringing this up. So there, she has a very real experience of like riding out a hurricane in a car, right? Um, which, I mean, that's kind of difficult to come to grips with. This is also why it took so long for her to write Salvage the Bones. Um, because she had that personal experience with the storm but the other thing that she notes in some of her interviews is that she, would, she was working at the University of New Orleans afterward, and she would commute into work and pass all of the devastation from the storm. So she was just seeing this every day going to work. Um, so that's kind of what took her so long to write the book, but also, I think, why she chose to write it, for, and, and also why it is such an extremely descriptive and just well-written story about the experience of people living through Katrina um, like in her area. OK. So just a little quick backstory. Again, my sad little photos <laughs> didn't make through, but that's OK. Um, so Hurricane Katrina rapidly escalated over the Gulf. And it hit, it came up to category five, and then just before it hit the, Gulf, the, Missis, the coast of Mississippi, it downgraded to category four. Um, the storm surge was not really like anything that people of our generation had seen before. Um, the com comparison of the book is Camille, and I will come back to that. But so, like, older people that have, were living in that area had the experience of Camille, but everybody else's experience with hurricanes were things where, you, like, category threes, where you can maybe just board up your house and ride out the storm. The problem for the people in the, the family in this book, and also her family, is that the storm surge pushed so far inland that it actually caused a bunch of flooding ar along the waterways in Mississippi and, of course, Louisiana and surrounding regions. And that the flooding is actually what caused a lot of devastation in this story, um, but also to her family as to why they had to flee. So there's another kind of theme about you know, the storm surge being much greater in capacity than they had ever seen before. And then the last thing to, that's worth noting about Hurricane Katrina is that the entire state of Mississippi was declared a disaster area after that storm. 
the coastal areas were completely destroyed and then the inland areas were completely flooded to the point like in the book there is a description during the storm and the flooding where the house they can feel it shift off um, and now of course they're concerned that it's going to collapse in on them right so there was just the whole state actually suffered from this even though if you think about it we don't normally think about hurricanes affecting areas that far north okay now to the book. I just wanted to give you a little bit of context, uh, but now finally to this book that I'm supposed to be talking about. Um, first of all, obviously I mentioned it was a National Book Award winner and there's a reason. The descriptions in this book are amazing. When I was reading this, it was, you know, it's easy to visualize what is going on because of the comparisons that she's making and the way that she's describing these events and these places and these smells and these feelings. Um, it was incredible. It is actually about a family, a motherless family, living in a rural southern Mississippi area um, before, during, and after Hurricane Katrina. I'll come back to that in a moment. It is told from the perspective of Esh, who is a 15-year-old a girl, okay? And then, as you've said, and I, I, I wanted to warn people, because I am an animal person, and I was bawling <laughs> because of this animal story, and I was like, oh, why? There's animals, I love animals. So there is a sad animal story that I should probably just give a warning to people about. There are some other characters in the novel, obviously. Um, her father, who she calls Daddy. Randall, who is her oldest brother. Um, Skeeda, if I'm saying that right, I don't know if I'm getting the total southern part of that, but um, who is the owner of a dog, China. And do China is also a central figure, hence the, the picture here. Um, her youngest brother, Junior, a person named Manny, who is actually her bait, she's, she finds out that she's pregnant in the book and it's the father of the child. And then there's Big Henry, who's just a family friend. And I think, you know, toward the end of the book, you kind of come to realize he really does care about her a lot. And I think he kind of wants to take care of her moving forward. At least that's my dream. But I think that's what's going to happen. Make it a silver lining. Okay, so the book itself Again, it's about the, the experience before, during, and after Hurricane Katrina, but it's broken up by chapters, so that chapters one through 10 are the days leading into Katrina, chapter 11 is the day of the storm, and then chapter 12 is kind of the, you know, after the, the storm is over, people are leaving their houses, and sort of like the destruction that, that they're dealing with at that point. Okay, so before the hurricane, there are some key themes here to talk about. One, of course, is gonna be preparing for the hurricane and the, this idea that um, not everybody can at, like, fully prepare for hurricanes because of how much it costs, right? And then there's some added things that I'll come back to, but there's some really good stories relating to the neighbors about how you know, the neighbors had prepared for the hurricane to the point they were trying to get to the neighbor's house and they can smell it and they smell like cleaning fluid. Right? So like, they had been so well prepared that they were able to clean their house before they evacuated. Um, you know, also the idea that the cost of food, um, there's, in, in the story, the father is basically an alcoholic and also gets injured. And so he's not able to help as much with preparations as it's kind of like put all on the children. Well, what that means is they're going to the store at the last minute and they're just trying to have to pick through what's left. Um, and, you know, I've, I, lived, I was in Florida during a hurricane season, we didn't get hit, so, but I kind of do have some concept of what that looks like to kind of go into the store right before a hurricane and you see like, okay, a lot of the wealthier families, they have the ability to prepare before hurricane even starts. They have their hurricane checklist, they've got a basement full of goods or, you know, a, a closet full of goods. So that wasn't the case with this family. So a lot of the preparation for them is just trying to scavenge whatever they can pull together. Um, they have, for example, they have chickens, that are like free range chickens. So they walk around picking up all the eggs and trying to hard boil them before the storm comes so that they have food to eat. Um, I mentioned the neighbors. Again, the neighbors are a theme that I kind of related back to her own personal story because they're wealthier white neighbors they're preparing for themselves. They're not really looking out for other neighbors. So that kind of parallels to her own personal experience of kind of being rejected by, by her neighbors. Um, okay, yes, I will move on. 
Chapter 11, again, is the day of the, the hurricane. So one theme that keeps coming back up is the, the character named Daddy, or like the father of the story. He continues to say, like they, he continues to reflect throughout the book on this could be like Camille, this might be a really big one, I think it's gonna be a doozy. Um, but that's about all that happens. So with him, there's this recognition that this could be a superstorm. But for everybody else, they had never lived through that before. So I, um, Christy isn't here, but I was able to sit down and talk to Christy Howell, who did live through Katrina. And one of the things that she was talking to me about is how if you drive around in like the Gulf of Mississippi, you see watermarks on the buildings from what Camille. And they have actually like marked those on the buildings to kind of remind people about how just how devastating these things can be. Um, so that's the, that's one of the problems with the day of the hurricane. People weren't really expecting a hurricane of that magnitude. The other thing that happens in the book is, although there are obviously gonna be calls for like, you know, evacuation, um, they weren't mandatory leading into the storm, and then the mandatory evacuation came the night before the storm hit. By that time, you kind of have to, again, ask our, our, we have to ask ourselves questions of, who is able to actually evacuate in these situations? Because we're talking about a family in poverty, they have a truck that's broken down, they're low on cash, right? They're just, they're kind of scrambling just to get food um, to save for the storm. So there is kind of another connection here through like who is able and unable to evacuate and that I'll come back to that later. Um, and then fleeing the flooding home. Okay, so there is a ridiculously harrowing story in here about this and it, again it, it relates back to her experience of the home flooding them having to flee. In this story the family when the flooding starts they actually go up into the attic. And while they're all sitting in the attic, then the water starts to rise into the attic, and they're thinking, there's this conversation about, um, there's been things on the news in previous hurricanes where people actually drown in their attic because that they go in there to flee, but then the water gets so high that they can't escape. So they actually have to kick out the roof, and from the roof, they have to jump onto this tree to try to like find safety at their grandparents' old house, and then they basically ride out the storm in that attic with the roof that's kind of missing at that, like they're just sitting in an attic with the roof missing. Um, the other thing that happens during this store, the, the degree of flooding and the, house, the flooding of the house, this is where the sad animal story comes in. Um, so the poor, you know, maybe I won't get into it, it's really sad, but the dog floats away in the flooded waters. And um, there's, a, again, with her descriptiveness, you can actually visualize this poor dog just, floating away is really sad. I'm just gonna let that go, but um, okay. I just wanna make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Oh, I'm realizing I forgot that, well, I'll come back to it. Okay. Okay, day, chapter 12 is the day after the storm. So what happens is after the storm is over, um, they, they leave the house and then they start basically walking to try to find other people. And what is worth noting is, um, sorry, I'm just a little bit of anxiety here. Um, I lost it, but it, it happened. So they start, oh, I know what it was. So, Part of the thing about going back to the hurricane and like riding out a hurricane is people basically would just put a bunch of sleeping bags in the living room and kind of like hang out together in the living room while the storm's going by. So they're all in their sleeping, their pajamas, right? They're just kind of like trying to navigate the storm in what you would wear to bed, right? So when you leave, basically people are just walking around in whatever they had on and probably aren't wearing shoes. There's a whole thing about them not having their shoes on. Um, they end up going for a drive just to kind of get a look at all the devastation. So again, they're sort of more inland for, to, from the coast than a lot of people, so they drive down to the coast, and basically what they see is buildings have been moved completely off of where they were and put down, like, put down somewhere else. So like, the floodwaters were so strong, they're just pushing buildings off of their foundations and displacing everything. So like the highways torn up along the coast, all of the storefronts and all that, those are all gone. Like everything is completely gone on the coast, okay? In their community, some of the houses still remain. So I mentioned their friend, their family friend, Big Henry, 
early on, him and his mother, their house kind of stayed intact, so they actually end up taking the family in um, for, you know, throughout the book and then obviously into the future that follows off the book. Um, the thing I, I do want to talk about is the meaning of the title, Salvage the Bones. So she, in interviews, she gets explicitly into what she meant by this. So salvage is also a very close word to savage. And so she thinks about it in two ways, right? The idea of the savagery of the hurricane itself and that experience, but then also trying to salvage what's left, right? So salvaging the remnants of what's left. And the reality is that with Hurricane Katrina and then all, some of these other superstorms that we've seen, there just isn't really anything less left that you can do. So as I mentioned, they had, been, they had gone to the store to try to get some, some supplies. They ended up with like a bunch of ramen noodles and like some canned meat or something. Um, when they go back to their house, like obviously it's been pushed a little bit off of its balance. So it's not really like a safe structure. But the other thing is, the wind has like taken, you know, taken parts off the house, and so all the stuff that they had saved is now basically destroyed in the storm. So there's a lot going on there, um, just in terms of trying to walk around and find things that you can eat or like safety, right? Okay. So now I want to talk a little bit about some of the context and themes of this this book. Um, one that and. You can get a little bit of it in the book, but it, you, if you watch her interviews or read her interviews, you get a lot more of this. There is a post-Katrina or post-hurricane framing around things. So what I just mentioned is the idea of salvage of the bones is basically after a hurricane, everybody that lives in these spaces is walking around just looking to like continue living, just finding basic needs. What happened after Katrina is we saw this dual framing. So for communities of color, they're out here trying to survive and salvaging what they can. They're considered looters, right? For people that are white, here they are, you know, same basic idea, but they're finding things. They're salvaging things. Somehow this is a legal activity for them. So it's illegal for communities of color and not for white communities. So that's one of the big themes of this, this novel here. The other thing that's really important to notice, I mean, to kind of recognize about this, is the way the people who are victims of the storms are blamed for not evacuating. And what I mean by this is, um, after Katrina, everyone basically, you know, the dues, if you will, I don't want to blame the media, but um, <laughs> there's this narrative that it's like, why didn't they evacuate? They knew a storm was coming. But that overlooks all the aspects of, did they even have the capacity to do that? Right? And one of the things I did not mention um, at that earlier, that again, when I was talking to Christy and she helped remind me, is a lot of times people with animals won't evacuate because the shelters don't actually allow animals in. So it's, you know, you're kind of like leaving your animal to deal with the storm and then just you know, heading out for safety. So there's also that kind of idea going through here. The other thing that people seem to overlook about this storm and other storms is the evacuation centers themselves were destroyed. So even people that did evacuate had to deal with absolute destruction, right? So it's, there's these interesting narratives. Um, the last kind of narrative around this is if you think about the way the media focused their attention on New Orleans, we didn't hear the stories of the people that were actually most affected in Mississippi because there, the levees broke, the, the Superdome was destroyed, you know, all the, the stuff that the, the devastation of what was going on in the Superdome, right, to the people that did evacuate. But what it did is it overlooked some of these other stories that were really important as well. Um, so again, this is why she kind of wanted to make sure to write this text. All right, so earlier I forgot to mention um, the theme of motherhood. So I'll come back to that right now since there is a theme of motherhood going through this book. So China, the dog character, has actually just had puppies. And so she is a new mother trying to navigate a storm with puppies. I don't want to tell you the ending about the puppies either. I won't share the poor puppies. Um, <laughs> it's like, sorry. I did, I know. <laughs> they tried. 
The other story is, again, that Esh is finding out as this novel is going on that she is pregnant. So in the novel, she finds this out. And then she's having, this is kind of going back to this myth of Medea. Um, she's reading at the, that point, she's reading the, the Greek mythology around Medea. And so she's making kind of connections about her life and Medea's life because Manny, who is the father of her child, basically doesn't want to acknowledge that it's his child. He's actually living with another woman, so he's been committing, you know, he's been cheating on his girlfriend. Um, and he basically, like, he mistreats her and sort of, like, shoves her aside. Okay, so she's feeling a lot like that character. Um, she responds a little bit differently. She doesn't actually go on a rampage or anything, right? Um, but there's that. And then the other, you know, again, I read some <laughs> interviews with Jasmine Ward. Um, the other mother in the book that she kind of that relates back to Medea is the hurricane itself. So like the destruction of the hurricane being that kind of Medea figure in the text. Um, the reason why she actually has this theme of Medea running through the novel is because she wanted to lay claim to her Western um, literary heritage, if you will. And I'm just going to pull a quote. I'm sorry, it's so much better to just quote the author. Um, so here's a direct quote. It infuriates me to think that the work of white American writers can be universal and lay claim to classic texts while well, black and female authors are ghettoized as other. I wanted to align Esh with that classic text with the universal figure of Medea, the anti-hero, to claim that tradition as part of my Western literary heritage. So she makes a real effort here um, to, under the idea that Greek mythology really hasn't been connected back to stories about, about black families, right? So she's really trying to make an effort to do that. I think I talked really fast, I don't know, but are there any questions? <laughs> that oh, right, I'm sorry, yes. That's... That yes, so in th that is correct. The other motherhood theme is Esha's mother, um, who died in childbirth, giving, like, giving birth to her youngest brother, Junior, and so she has like, memories of her mother, and those come up throughout the book about trying to connect back with her mom. Um, there are also stories about you know, the picture in her, in her dad's room and how he made sure to go back and get the picture and take it with him, um, kind of you know, how connected he was to her as his wife as well. Yeah. Yes. I did not, but she is 42, I believe, 42. So very young and very accomplished, right? So it's like super impressive. She looks 12 in this picture. Oh. <laughs> well, I pulled those pictures from, um, one is from Tulane on her faculty bio page, and then the other one I believe is from her publisher. So that's, I, there were other pictures but, um, of her more contemporarily, but they're too small and I was worried that they would, like, the image would get distorted by making it larger. So I just kind of went with all those pages. Now, I didn't, I don't get that impression. Okay. I get the impression that she wanted to tell a story that was similar to one, like her own, but make it unique. And so like make the book its own thing. And she maybe identifies more with the book and the story itself than a specific character within the book. Yes. Has she faced challenges getting her work published? I wish I knew a better answer to that. Um, I don't know much about her first novel. So, do you know more about that? No, not yet. Yeah, I was like, okay. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I can say right now that she is doing like, she's, you know, you can get interviews of her that are in Australia and overseas, like Europe and all that. So she is very well received in the writing community. Um, last, was it last fall, like a year ago? Yeah, a year ago, she was basically the presenter at, for the Dole Institute of Manny's and spoke at the Liberty Hall. 
Um, so she, she's been re very well received very recently. I don't know about like historically, like prior to you know Salvage the Bones coming out. But every like all of the literary kind of write-ups about Salvage the Bones, they all talk about it as if it's going like it is that it is going to be considered a classic text of literature. Um, just because there's so, I, I wish I could have done it justice, but there's so much going on in the story um, that I didn't even touch on because it doesn't kind of relate back to the hurricane. So one example is um, Skeeta, no, not Skeeta, Randall, her oldest brother, he's actually trying out for the summer league team and part like, in a, like he's playing a basketball game and if he does really well, he might get a scholarship to the summer league team. Well, this is also at the same time that Esh finds out that she's pregnant, and then Skeeta, her other brother, realizes like wh who the father is and gets really angry. At the basketball game, a fight breaks out between her brother and the like the cousin of this the baby you know the baby's father, um, and then Randall actually gets kicked off the basketball court. So when I was reading that, it was kind of like, oh man, like if. The way it was phrased up to that point, this is like every, this kid was putting everything in on bat, like getting that scholarship, right? And being able to maybe go off to college and then all this other stuff happens and it's kind of like over. Now that being said, after the storm, um, the gym is destroyed. So it's like, no one has basketball, I don't know. Um, so yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is some. I mean, we've seen some of these narratives play out in Superstorm since Katrina as well. It's just kind of a common theme in the media about how we characterize victims. Um, so yeah, if you are looting, you actually like law enforcement can take you know direct action against you. It's very subtle. Um, when you hear her talk about it, it's a lot kind of, then it makes a lot more sense. Um, to me, the novel itself, I just think is a really, like, you know, you pick up on the motherhood themes, you pick up on the Medea thing because it, it's so easily connected, but then thinking about like the victims and how they're treated in the media and then by people on the outside that have never maybe lived through a hurricane, um, that was a lot of her motivation was just telling that story and saying like, hey, this is what it's really like being here. Um, but it's, to me, it wasn't overtly political, but I think maybe some other people think it is. I don't know. Yeah. The themes that you're focusing on seem to be very southern oriented. I think I'm thinking about comparisons to the California wildfires, which is where you've got Similar stuff happening where people's cell phones go down, the towers go down, there's no electricity to charge the phone. So as far as information access, you're, you're stranded. And it's more than just rich white people's houses being burned up out there. I mean, others are being affected too. Right. The media seems to be spinning a narrative that is affecting you know, the white, wealthy, middle class. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought of that when you were talking about how the, the framing is. So yeah. It just seems to me there's a parallel to what's been Right, sort of the way we frame natural, like the impact of natural disasters and like who it's, who it's affecting. I mean, if you think about this politically, and maybe this is the, the political, political aspect of this, the framing, like by framing it in the way that it is, it does become framed, then we've defined who the victims are and we've also defined who the recipients of any aid are. Um, so that's really the problematic part of this is that it's, it's omitting the communities of color and you know, the effect of climate change on communities of color more generally, but, um, and sort of divert, you know, in a way, arguing that aid is for these deserving people here and not for these people over here. Um, but yeah, I would say that, that that is maybe a broader media problem in the media when we're talking about like natural disasters. But both those disasters are different parts of the top. Right. Common yeah. Right, yes. I have, do any of my 
my colleagues teach this book? No? Hmm. Some of us teach other books. I'm sure. I'm just asking. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I mean, just kind of a, a quick summary of what I liked about it. It's, it's really, I, again, I chose this because it's more about like Katrina, which people know about, right? And maybe this helps challenge some of the ideas about the stories around Katrina. Um, the other thing is it's contemporary, so I was hoping maybe younger people would like it more. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but, um, but yeah, so I just, I, the descriptions of, the people and like the way she tells the story. It's like, she's just this incredible writer. Um, so I'm definitely gonna read her other stuff. But um, I hadn't had as much experience with, with her work, so it was nice to be able to do this. Um, so thank you for inviting me. <laughs>